Bigfoot, its name, the common vernacular Bigfoot, comes from the large tracks that it left. Early miners and explorers would find these large tracks in the dirt. And oh, Bigfoot. <laughs> you know, very original. Kind of like the guy from Texas is named Tex. You know, it, it, it's, it's very... Uh, it's very funny how that happened. A lot of people in the field of cryptozoology, now cryptozoology means the study of unknown animals, you know, just like an unknown ape that hasn't been found yet or some class of fish that hasn't been found. That's in definitive terms, that's what cryptozoology is. But over the years, a lot of other weirder creatures have been reported that people have seen Bigfoot type creatures vanish in a flash of light, or they've been seen at the same location and time as UFOs and Bigfoot together. You know, a lot of people in cryptozoology have no time for those stories. They're just, they're just unknown animals. I've been interested in Bigfoot and related subjects since I was a little kid. In fact, when I went to college, I majored in psychology and anthropology specifically so I could uh, pursue the Bigfoot angle. My mom, when she went to school, she studied anthropology, so she was a big anthropology buff. And being in the woods, eight or nine, ten years old, talking to my mom, all the other kind of stuff. Oh yeah, she was very always a proponent of Bigfoot. My mom's a big believer in Bigfoot. So it's one of the few things I can talk about my mom with, you know, is like, you know, hey, Bigfoot. So growing up, I was always out in the woods camping. While a lot of friends were out surfing and going to the beach, my family, we were always out in the woods. I love it all. Uh, I'm always in search of Bigfoot. So being born and raised in Washington State, one of the biggest hot spots in the whole world is Mount Adams area. Gosh, I've listened to so many podcasts too, geeking out on that kind of stuff. Because there are, when I, so I love to climb mountains. I love to be out in nature and do adventure, sports, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I spend a lot of time in the woods and there are times where I'm by myself as well and you feel, when you go in different places in the woods, you feel different energies as you're going through. Sometimes the hair will stand up on the back of your neck, other times you'll feel like total euphoria, and yet you can't see anything around you, and you're like, you can't help but wonder like, what is going on? There's clearly something going on here, but I can't see it. The first book I even remember having as a kid was like a comic book on UFO stories and monsters and that sort of thing, and that piqued my interest. And then one day in Search Off came off on TV with Leonard Nimoy and they had a Yeti episode and that's pretty much what started my obsession. And a number of years back, um, I had an encounter with my brother-in-law at uh, my father-in-law's property in the Sierras and we were on that fire road and we were hunting. We were coyote hunting. Now I'm not really a big predator hunter, but he wanted to go so I went with him and we set up this we kind of hide, hide it under this big giant oak tree and we had these rocks and we were kind of up on a hill and there's this big clearing and he set out this coyote call, which is this horrible speaker. You press buttons and it does wounded rabbit call and dying calves call and rah, rah, and it was echoing all through the canyon. And he had these little look like foxtails on a thing that bounce around to try to attract a predator. I'd kind of been into Bigfoot before that, like interested, you watch the shows on TV and stuff. But we we're up there and we we're all camouflaged out and we got our rifles and we we're all hiding in the bushes. And I just remember thinking to myself, predator call. Wow, I wonder if we call in something else other than coyotes. We're sitting there, it's starting to get dark, kind of getting really hard to see. I kind of hear something behind me coming through the leaf litter and it's almost like a squirrel or like a step, then a step, but it's pretty far behind me and it's faint and whoosh, a rock, big old rock flies right over my shoulder crunches in the dirt. Bounce up, I start looking around. What was that? My brother-in-law kind of jumps back and we're looking at each other and we're like, what was that? Was that a coyote? He's like, I don't know. What, what, we, sh 
we should get out of here. So we very quickly just basically got up and left. And on the way out, he grabbed his call. And we we're on the fire road going back to the main road. And we could hear footsteps behind us. We'd hear two or three steps. We'd take a few steps and we could kind of hear something behind us. And we turn around with our flashlights hello, anybody there? Couldn't see anything. We'd take a few steps and it sounded like something was trailing us out. And every once in a while you'd hear a tree snap or something behind us. And then you'd hear maybe something else come to find out. There are a lot of Bigfoot sightings in this area. That particular encounter was very physical, was very here. I did feel a pretty good sense of dread that day. Like, so, cause I didn't know what was going on. Something's throwing a rock. And we got rifles and we got flashlights and stuff. We, we can't see. We know something's out there, something through a rock, there's footsteps. It's really fascinating when you get in there and then you start to think, well, maybe there is more to this Bigfoot thing. To me, you know, I was always a big animal lover as a kid. And the fact that we can have an animal that's very similar to man that was still around in the world that was undiscovered. Just, I've always loved exploration. I was a kid, I always wanted to go around the corner. And to me, that was like the ultimate corner, you know, as a just child. And it was like, it was almost, it was like romantic fantasy in a lot of ways, but it was, it seemed so real. At age 12, we moved to London for about six months. And I remember going to a bookstore and they had a book on the Loch Ness Monster. And I remember asking the lady uh, at the bookstore, do you have any other books on these type of subjects? And she had a general book on different mysteries. And then it was Bigfoot, Yeti, you know, Loch Ness, UFOs. And that was sort of my first exposure to Bigfoot because all I knew about was the Yeti at the time. And for me, Bigfoot was always, I don't even remember when the first time I heard about it. I mean, at seven or eight years old, you could probably go back in time and ask me, you know what Bigfoot is? Like, yeah, he's a big hairy man. So I remember seeing Harry and Anderson's when I was a kid, because that came out in the 80s. Um, some of the old uh, In Search Of stuff with Leonard Nimoy. There was always some kind of, and there still is to this day, there's always some kind of a documentary or special where they have the Patterson-Gimlin film. And my mom, she, 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 she's not an anthropologist that she does that for a living, but that's what she got her college degree in. It's a good filter to put on when you're looking at the Bigfoot subject, because when you look at like the stuff that Dr. Meldrum and even Cliff Brackman does, where they look at the morphology of tracks the type of locomotion, the weight, the build of the foot, the structure of the body based on a foot, the positioning of bones being different than a human when you upscale. Because if you take a human and you upscale them to 800 pounds, we're not very proportioned for that. But if you move some leg bones and make some things thicker and some things wider, you could very easily get a bipedal creature that big and have it be very, very fast. So when you look at the anthropology section of it, it gets into that and explains a lot of the the physicality of these creatures and what people report. Well, so originally the original model when I came out of school was that we had the split between us and the apes seven million years ago, right, theoretically. We didn't know anything prior to that. We knew very little about gorillas and chimps. Evolutionary history passed that because there aren't a lot of fossil. The, the biggest ape we had was Gigantopithecus, extinct about 300,000 years ago. But all we had was teeth and a little bit of a jawbone. So we knew very little. On the human side, we went straight from Australopithecus down to Homo habilis to Homo erectus, and eventually gave way to Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. And those are the only two that were known to live side by side. In the last 10 years, that's changed dramatically. A few years ago, remember the big thing in the news when they discovered the human hobbit? which is Homo florensis, I believe, which was in the Southeast Asia. It was a race of humans that were three and a half, three feet tall. Very close to anatomically modern humans lived at the same time as a lot of humans did, but they were just small. We're not talking dwarfism. We're not talking a uh, genetic mutation. We're just talking through evolution or whatever means necessary creation, whatever you want to believe. They're a small race of people. And it was last year they, uh, they came across the, Deno, the Denovisians or whatever it was, I believe, in Europe, where there were some other offshoot. They weren't humans. They weren't Neanderthals. They were something else. And they were built quite robust. And you look at Homo heidelbergensis, they were built, you know, with their leg muscles. And they can tell from, it's amazing what they can tell from bone, from ligament attachment and muscle attachment to how strong and bulky. And some of the recreations of some of the early humans these were big, tough people, you know, um, hairy, very muscular, run down animals, had to fight for a living, you know, and, and you look at the fossil record and they're discovering things all the time. There's a, there's a theory that 
modern Bigfoot is a descendant of Gigantopithecus or Gig Gigantopithecus blackii. They've really only found some jaw fragments and some teeth from it, but they've kind of extrapolated. And there's some debate in the zoological world if they were upright or if they were more like a big walking gorilla or if they were more like a Sasquatch. But from what they can extrapolate, that might be very close to what a Bigfoot would really look like. You know, seven, eight, nine, ten feet tall, thousand pound, giant orangutan looking ape, which some people describe. We discovered about some apes prior to our theoretical split with the, you know, with the chimps about eight to nine million years ago that might have been geared towards becoming bipedal. And since then, we've discovered a plethora of human species, hominids in Africa, in Europe that lived side by side with Homo sapiens, Neanderthal, Denisovans. We had Homo floresiensis in Asia that was alive 40,000 years ago. In Africa, there's Homo naledi which was alive 200,000 years ago. And they had really small brains like Australopithecus. They're very, very primitive, but completely bipedal. So the model where you know, certain primitive traits were wiped out through evolution doesn't exist anymore. Now we know it's possible to have something like Bigfoot. Whether any of those became Bigfoot or, or cousins to Bigfoot, we don't know, right? Genetics, they'll tell that story down the line. But the possibilities now are a lot more open than they were at least when I was in school. I always, like I was saying with the UFO stuff, always had an interest in the paranormal. And when you look at Bigfoot, you're like, you want something to be there and you start looking at the evidence and you're like, there is something there. And then you start experiencing it and you're like, I don't believe, I know there's something there. I absolutely 100% believe Bigfoot exists. I think we have enough evidence out there to suggest that that species is, is real, 100%. So the way I work personally is I, I have a, maybe around 20 to 40 areas worldwide, 20 good ones in the United States that I have my eye on. Based, and that's based on not just sightings report, but historical sightings reports I did back, you know, hundreds of years, but also the location, what does it make sense biologically? Is there a water source nearby? Is there enough places to stay hidden? Is the population low enough that it's going to stay undiscovered? And, and then you sort of, if you can, head out to those spots. But most of them are pretty remote and it's they're hard to get to and you know you got to be able to have the money and the time some bigfoot researchers don't like the term bigfoot i kind of get it bigfoot chronicles doesn't sound as great as sasquatch chronicles some researchers and some have written whole blogs and whole books and whole sections saying that they don't really like the name bigfoot well, my specialty is a lot from a global perspective because I believe that it's a species that exists worldwide, at least where it's possible. You gotta understand, everybody thinks of Bigfoot as the Pacific Northwest in California. The South, especially all through East Texas, they have a huge, huge population of people that have experienced Sasquatches. East Texas is very famous, the land of LBL, the Florida skunk ape, you know, have you ever heard people, you ever heard the expression, uh, the boogeyman will get you or the boogers? Well, down in the South, their term for Bigfoots are wood boogers. Watch out for the boogers. The boogers will get you, the wood boogers. You hear something snapping out in the woods. You hear something tromping around out there, something peeking in your tent. It's a wood booger. What it is is a Southern variety of Sasquatch. And as we encroach more and more into the woods and get out there more, and I think as their population actually grows, um, we're getting more and more encounters. Some are friendly, some are benign, some are not so nice. And because uh, they're a creature that has wants and needs and their own feelings and their own mindset, and they're going to do what they want to do. You know, why the bear cross the road? Because it wanted to. So originally apes or hominids, hominids, everything came from Africa, right? So it moved through Europe. So ground zero for something like Bigfoot, for the common ancestor for Bigfoot would be Eurasia for me, because we have all these fossils from anywhere from 300,000 years ago, 2 million years ago, of a plethora of species that theoretically could have evolved into Bigfoot from Eurasia. And if you, if you look at a map and you look at where all the fossils have been found, and then you look at another map where today there are sightings of Bigfoot type creatures, they, they pretty much are on top of one another. So for example, in the Caucasus Mountains, you have the Almasti. So then you travel further east into Siberia where it's called the Chuchuna, which is another Bigfoot type which is incidentally is right in front of where we once had the Beringia Land Bridge, which a lot of the people that first populated North America came through the Beringia Land Bridge. Probably not all of them, 
But if you have another bipedal species, it would have came through that land bridge. So theoretically, the Chu Chu Nao, for example, could be very closely related to Bigfoot. And of course, if you follow the mountain range into Tibet, Nepal, and Bhutan, you have the Yeti. Across the way, the Pamir Mountains into China, they call it the Yaren. And to me, I really believe it's the same species, that obviously there's going to be some regional differences, evolutionary differences through time, or some very minor differences, you know? Like, if you look at all humans across the world, we have some differences, right? Genetic differences, this could be the same case. So I believe there's really a pathway out of Africa, through Eurasia, through the mountain ranges in Central Asia, and up into North America, and probably down the coast into South America. Here's the thing, too, when you start going over to Europe and Russia and Siberia, it was taken a lot more seriously by, by uh, European anthropologists, so they've done a little more studies. And they've found the same evidence that we have, you know, the footprints that have some hair samples, you know, the same, and it matches perfectly to what we have here in North America. So I think, again, it's the matching quality from different time periods, from different people unrelated countries, different languages and all that, you know, I found to me is the most compelling. But yeah, when, when you look at all across the United States and you look at what people are experiencing in, in like Maine and the Northeast and compare that to the South, compare that to the West Coast and compare that to the Pacific Northwest, to Canada, there's a lot of similarities, but there are differences from what they're describing. There are differences in temperament of the animals, you know, in the Pacific Northwest and in Canada, people, you know, eight, nine, 10 foot tall Sasquatch in the South people. Yeah, they're about seven and a half foot tall, eight foot tall at the most. One of the things in biology research is Bergman's rule. The farther north you go, the bigger animals tend to be. Bears and mountain lions tend to be bigger when you go north. Not always, there are some animals that, that get smaller, but even a coyote in the desert could weigh 10 pounds. It's gonna be 40 pounds up in the north or in higher areas. They gotta be a bigger, robust species. Every Native American tribe in North America has a story about the giant hairy, smelly giants in the woods, you know? A lot of them pretty violent. And then I, um, I found that there was a painting from Mongolia from the 1800s about, that looks exactly like a Bigfoot, including the big brass associated, you know, with the Patterson, Patterson film. And also it was, it showed a picture of somebody getting the arms torn off. And we're talking about two separate cultures, obviously they didn't have a whole lot in common, but are depicting the exact same mythology, if you want to call it mythology, you know? And what, in North America, there's what, maybe 500 names for Bigfoot? Every tribe has their stories, you know, and early settlers, I know, have their stories. Even uh, the Vikings, supposedly, you know, encountered the big, hairy, smelly guys up in northern Canada, wherever else they, you know, they landed. I think it's kind of in our modern day hubris to think that we know everything and we're great now and people 200 years ago were stupid or something. It's like, no, no, they really weren't. They're just as... They didn't consider, you know, people 200 years ago didn't consider themselves old fashioned. They considered themselves modern. They considered themselves um, educated. And in fact, not being as plugged in, they were probably aware, way more aware of their surroundings and what were going on than we are today by far with all our digital distractions in our modern life. So I think it's very important to look at historical encounters. One gentleman is Tom Seawood. He's actually part of the Kwakwaka Ewok tribe in the Pacific Northwest. And he does tours and adventures all around Vancouver and Vancouver Island. And he's had a number of encounters. And being a full-fledged tribe member, he actually talks about their tribal beliefs of Bigfoot. For them, they have the Zunaqua, which is the wild woman of the woods. It's this big hairy woman with a wicker basket. And it's kind of their version of a boogeyman. Don't go out at night listen to your parents, don't go out and smoke cigarettes, don't go out and steal food, don't go out past 10, the Zunaqua will get you. And it's way, way back in their tradition, it was this big hairy woman who would scoop bad children up, put her in the basket on her back, take them out and eat them. And that was part of their tradition, kind of their boogeyman. And for as much as it was kind of there, you know, to keep kids at night, don't scare them, there was also a real tradition. And the Kwakwak Ewok tribe, each family has, you know, some people have a thunderbird, some people have a cougar, some people have a have a bear, some people have um, a beaver, part of their creation story. And they're actual families that have a Sasquatch as their, as their animal. And to them, they have them on their totem poles. It's just, there are no spirit animals and there are no flesh and blood animals. For a lot of them, it's one and the same. So a Sasquatch, a thunderbird, a bear, a beaver, a squirrel they're all they're all the same to them and they all recognize them as being there that they also recognize that the zunaqua the male zunaqua and the 
female Zunik or the wild woman of the woods. They refer to them as the wild man or the tribe. They refer to them as people, quite interestingly. And if you go 1,500 miles to the south, they have the famous Hairy Man cave paintings, which date back seven or 800 or 1,000 years ago. This cave where they have deer, they have elk, they have bears, and then they have these big, hulking, very creepy looking, large, which cave paintings of what appear to be a Sasquatch. And it definitely looks like a Bigfoot. You see a big dad one, you see a mom one, and you see a baby one. And you say, well, what's what's the story behind the hairy man? And it's strikingly a lot like the Quack Quack Ewok tribe. They say, hey, don't go out at night. The hairy man will get you. We hunt during the day. They hunt at night. Women shouldn't travel alone to go get water or anything because they'll abduct people. It's the hairy man. Don't go out at night. The hairy man will get you. And if you look all across virtually every tribe in the United States, from desert tribes to mountain tribes to the plains tribes, they all have a tradition of Bigfoot. Whether it's the Genosqua, the stone giants in from the East Coast, to different versions of the word Wendigo, which everybody thinks of Wendigo as the Native American cannibal spirit, but there was actually some translations of Wendigo that show more of a Sasquatch creature that ate people. And for a lot of their ape-like features, I think there is a lot of human in these creatures. And I think that's what does make them so fascinating is when you go to the zoo and you look at a gorilla or a chimpanzee, you still see an animal, a very intelligent animal. But when you think of a Sasquatch and then you get any counters or you experience one of these things close up, it's a predator like a human. It's the master of its environment. And what makes humans the dominant species on the planet is we're intelligent. We're not necessarily the biggest and strongest. So sink is something that's probably just about on par with you in intelligence, but is built like the Incredible Hulk. And that's a very, like it can do whatever it wants to do and you're at their mercy. When I go out in the field, the first thing I look for obviously is an area that not just has had sightings, I think that's overrated, but an area that makes sense biologically in terms of having resources, shelter, food, water. Also, it has a long history of sightings, not just modern sightings, right? So, and then you go out, when you go out in the woods, you look for signs, for example, broken tree branches. And granted, I guess that's a little overrated. Everybody, you know, unfortunately that's been featured on Finding Bigfoot. And now everybody think that every broken branch in the woods is Bigfoot. You know, the truth is you go off to the snow, the snow will break branches when it, when it melts and so forth. But if you can find branches that are twisted, for example, and really big tree trunks have been moved or it's a little more intriguing, you know? One of the very, if I'm going to an area I've never been before or an area I haven't been in a long time, I go online and I just start to, the very first thing I do is background research. But also if you take a look, you just Google earth, you realize there's hundreds of miles of trees and woods that not only is there no people around, people have probably never been other than flown over, very rugged terrain. And there's lots of hiding places, even, you know, a quarter mile off of a road. You know, and you're in some really deep, steep country that no one's going to, no one's back there, lots of places to hide. So I start by looking at historical encounters. Where have people seen before? What trailheads and what areas? Then I look at maps, start saying, what are some areas? Where's water? I always love to look in August, October, especially in Southern California, the driest time of the year. Because if I can find water on a trail or an area, an old dried up pond, a creek that's dried up, but still has pools, if I can find water in October in California, you know there's gonna be animals around because that's the hottest, driest time of the year because it's had all summer to dry out. There hasn't been any snow or any rain. So I look for water sources, how close are they to main roads, food sources, hunting areas, protected areas. And from there, if I actually go out there when you're actually in the woods, they're way better trackers and people than me, but I'm looking at tracks. I'm looking for tree breaks and snaps of something going through the woods. I'm looking, always looking up at the high ground because the high ground's important. If you see what looks like a bunch of trees falling over, well, maybe they're not falling over on accident. Maybe that's a blind. You gotta think like a hunter. You'd wanna obscure your area to watch a trail. The trail that you're on might be a human footpath, but are there game trails? Or do you see other little trails going up and off all over the place? Well, this is for animals to go. Animals like using trails because like humans, trails are easier than just walking through the bushes. So you look through these, you look for blinds, you look for areas, you look for the classic tree structures and X formations and other things that people find out there. One of the other phenomenons that's very common is I've been out in the middle of the woods, very far and deep, and you find a fire ring. It'll have a circle of rocks and it'll have wood in it, not burned, no charcoal. Or you'll find like an old cooler or like a coat and you'll find a fire ring like someone was camping out here 
but no one's used the fire. You can tell no one drove or camped over here and no human's going to log a, this out there and it, weird stuff. And it's almost like a creature or something is emulating what humans are doing. Or it almost seems like a trap sometimes where you're like, wow, this is a very weird fire pit. There's no, there's no fire in the fire pit, but it has logs in it and it's in a circle. There's some human items and debris out here. And then you look up a hill and there's some things that maybe look like a blind or some big hiding trees or some rocks. And you're like, this might be an ambush spot. Or it could be campers or it could be somebody on the run. Any creature any, with a lot of intelligence, uh, all the great ape species do it, humans do it, you get bored. I think these things do get creative. And I think going on to another subject, I think we are a lot of their entertainment. Why they do look in windows, why they do come around campsites, why they do throw rocks and acorns and shake our tents in the middle of the night and do that kind of stuff. I think they like to see our reactions. I think they get bored. They don't have the internet. They don't have cable. They don't have that kind of stuff. So I think it's very common for them to pester us. Sometimes they want to get us to go away. Sometimes we're interrupting a hunt, I think. Sometimes we're getting close to their young or where other ones are sleeping. Or sometimes they just want to screw with us. And other times I think you're curious and they just want to watch. You see on the TV shows where they're tree knocking and they're hooping and hollering and they're doing all this stuff. If you want to do it that way, that's fine. I think that's a great way to drive every creature in the woods away from you. I just say, watch your footing, be quiet, move stealthy, listen, watch, be aware of your surroundings, take a deep breath, smells, sights, sounds, watch your footprints, watch animal footprints. Are you seeing bear track? Are you seeing coyote prints? Are you what kind of what kind of poop you seeing out there? Coyote poop. What are they eating? Are there a lot of berries in there? And it sounds funny, but it gives you an idea. Hey, there's we're finding all this scat and it's got a lot of berries in it. Well, it's October. Okay, well berry season just came through. We're finding a lot of fur. Well, it must be hunting season. You know, am I hearing a lot of squirrels? Am I hearing a lot of birds? Am I hearing insects and crickets and rabbits and lizards running on rocks? Or is it dead eerily quiet? And I've experienced that in the woods where nothing, not a bird, not a squirrel, not a lizard, the mosquitoes seem to have gone away. And it is the weirdest feeling. Something is big out there. The king has come home. Everybody be quiet. So these are things that you have to look out for when you're in the woods. And the rest you just kind of got to learn. But the next step is a lot more interesting to me. It's something that's called a ground nest. Now people have reported, I've never found one, but people have reported seeing kind of like a ground nest like gorillas make. Gorillas sleep in nests. So if you can find these odd features, you know, in the landscape, like a nest that seems to be out of place a little bit, it's a good sign. Next, you look for step two, which is tracks. You know, and obviously you have to know the difference between bear tracks and Bigfoot tracks, which isn't, which isn't always easy. You know, I'm sure I've been fooled. You know, I'd like to not think I'm, I don't get fooled, but we all do. You know, sometimes it can be pretty similar. And then, you know, obviously, then you start listening for sounds, weird sounds, like some kind of howling or... So ultimately, all that's crap because it's useless, right? It's just, it's, you just tell a story. And a lot of people are satisfied with that. I, it annoys me. I think we need a lot better evidence than that. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's pointless. Ultimately, you want hair samples, blood sample. That's the only thing that's really going to lead to the next step. The chances of, you know, you kill a million animals in a bunch of different locations, less than 0.00001% is gonna become a fossil. It is incredibly hard. It's gotta be the right amount of air getting to it and not getting to it, the right amount of ground, compression, preservation for, for bone to turn into stone, which is fossilization. It's almost like forming a diamond. It has to be a very specific set of circumstances to form a fossil. And there are, you know how many billions of tons of earth are out there that are, un, that are unturned over that we don't know about that could, could still have fossils. So our fossil record is, it's so incomplete, we don't even know how incomplete it is. And from what they're doing from genetic studies from humans that came out a few years ago where they're finding that anatomically modern humans, people today have Neanderthal DNA in them. It used to be that we thought there was this race of pre-people, this race, there was, you know, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo florensis, Neanderthals, Cro-Magnums, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens. You know, we were all these different races. Well, what they're finding is they interbred a lot and crossed over. And you think of tribes of people taking over another tribes of people. The world was very sparsely populated, so you had to procreate how you saw fit. 
how to raise with your kid. If you were a modern human and there was a Neanderthal woman around and she was good at hunting, you were gonna take her as your wife. It was, it was, you know, it was the option and vice versa. So there was a lot, they're starting to discover that, which is very fascinating. There was a lot more interbreeding and crossing over. And it's painting a very different picture than even what you would think about 10 years ago. So the biggest complaint I get is that, why isn't Bigfoot captured on video or in pictures all the time? And part of me has no answer because I agree, we should really be getting better evidence. And maybe the evidence is out there, but it's not public. Now I've seen some private couple pictures are actually pretty good. Not maybe Patterson Gimlin good, but pretty close. And there's some footage even on YouTube that I think it's pretty intriguing if you, you know, if you know what you're, what you're looking for. But there's a, I mean, 80% of those you see on YouTube or hoaxes, you know, and I don't, even Bigfoot experts get fooled. You know, I'm sure I've been fooled by a couple, but some people should know better. I think a lot of people go to the wrong place. They kind of go out in the field after there's been a sighting and you're where Bigfoot was. You're not where he's going to be or where he is. You know, you're talking about an intelligent biological species. I think you have to go a lot deeper in the woods if you're really going to get some quality footage. And look, and I've been out there, right? I've been in the woods. Man, it, it's hard to get around. There's, you're moving like, you know, a, a mile per like a couple hours sometimes, you know, a species that's adapted specifically for that environment if he wants to stay out of sight. Especially we're talking fur color that can camouflage with the trees very easily. It's hard, man. It's hard to get a lot of pictures and, and footage out there. But I agree, that's the main skeptic point that we should have a better answer for, and I don't have one. Well, 150 years ago, nobody knew what a gorilla was. If you guys are familiar with what an okapi is, it's a cousin of the giraffe. They thought it was a legend until the 1930s. They're discovering new species in small areas, mostly, you know, insects and birds and things all the time. But when you have a species that's intelligent enough to actively try to prevent itself from being discovered, you go to different parts of the country. You go to Oregon, Washington State, go back in the hills there. You go to these small towns. You talk to them about Bigfoot, they don't even blink an eye. It's like, yeah, you have bears around here? Yeah, we have bears. Do you have Bigfoot? Yeah, we have Bigfoots. What? You know, it's like not a big deal. To these rural people, to these people that live out there, we're the idiots for not believing. It was out in North Bend, Washington, up in the backwoods, Mount Garfield. Uh, there was a night and I was sitting by the fire and is a full moon classic story um and this crazy noise like i i still to this day can't repeat it i i try to be like oh you know it's not like a howl but it was whatever it was i'd never heard it before um i i went online and tried to google all these different animal sounds and what animals are capable of couldn't find anything even remotely close but that night when i was sitting by the fire and that sound was coming through. It sounded like something was walking through and, and it was very alarmed that we were there and it was letting us know like, hey, I'm here, I'm coming through. Like, it, and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. So I knew that it was to alarm me and because it felt alarmed. This, the noise went on for oh, maybe five minutes, however long it took for it to pass by. And then it took like a solid 30 minutes sitting by the fire, just frozen, being like, all right, what am I going to do if something goes down here? <laughs> you know? To be honest, the most interesting case that I know of is not even in North America. It's in Kenya. And this is something that very few people have ever heard about because it's always been written in French and not in, never translated in English. There's an anthropologist in the 1980s that was doing her work in, um, in Kenya. Her name was Eberhard Rumagea. So she was very famous at the time. Her books were used in universities and the whole deal. And she started hearing about these Bigfoot type creatures, for lack of a better word, in the forest in Kenya, which no one had ever heard about before. Except they're a little more gray style, a little more human looking, but still very primitive, covered in hair. So she got interested as an anthropologist, even though it sounded kind of crazy. And it started, so she started following up on it and she, and she found tales that they had artifacts. They were using bows and arrows which is not something that you see typically with Bigfoots in North America or Yetis in Nepal, for example. But then she found a pair of, of arrow that was left in the ground by what she called X. She didn't come up with a better name, she called it Species X. And if you look at the arrow, it's a very primitive, it's like Stone Age technology. 
it doesn't match any of the other arrows in, in any of the tribes in Africa. And to me, I always found fascinating that you have something Bigfoot-like in Africa where we originated and apes originated, but it had the same quality as a Bigfoot in terms of doesn't have a language, it's, got, it's covered in hair, it's primitive, but it seems to have more of a culture. That's what started my idea that we can kind of trace back Bigfoot from North America through Asia all the way back to Africa, and there's a link. What's most compelling to me is the links. You start making links that make sense, then you start thinking in terms of a real biological species. I think if you want two really good pieces, the best evidence that actual scientists, actual biologists, actual people have broken down and can prove through frame rates, through size comparisons, locomotions, combined with eyewitness reports. One is the Patterson-Gimlin film, the one that was filmed in Bluff Creek in 1967. That has been dissected a million ways, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. There's a lot of independents that have done their breakdowns of it. And from the proportions, it can't be a man in a suit because the legs are too long, the arms are too long. And if you did an arm extension to make an arm longer, the elbow would stay in the same place. Things that don't add up with that film. Not to mention the historical of that area of there being a lot of Bigfoot encounters the way the thing moves, the muscle tone. I think it's because the patterson Gimlin film is so clear, especially now that it's been cleaned up. Um, I saw a second generation copy, and it's, you know, I'm not gonna go 100% in with it, but it's pretty impressive. You can literally see the muscles, you know, contracting and moving. So no one is able to debunk it. I mean, there's been seven guys that claim to be in a suit, but none of them have proven that they were in a suit, and that's like literally seven people, so they couldn't all have been in the suit. It's an impressive, you know, piece of footage. I, I've never met Patterson. I've met Gimlin a couple of times, you know, and he's a, he's a really affable guy, you know, and it's hard to see him lying about it. I think that if it was a hoax, he wasn't in on it. Now, Patterson's a little more complicated character. And, you know, the one thing that maybe could point towards a hoax is the fact that he had a drawing prior to having the footage that looks a whole lot like what the footage looks like. But then again, he knew what Bigfoot was supposed to look like. He's been collecting evidence for years, you know? You know, no one's ever disproven the film. No one's proven to 100%, but no one's disproven the film. And that's pretty impressive considering we get a lot of crappy fake footage all the time. So the Patterson-Gimlin film, if you want to know what a West Coast Bigfoot looks like, a female, as a matter of fact. The other one that I've met and talked to several times, he's a great researcher, is Ron Moorhead in his Sierra Sounds. In the 70s, in a hunting camp uh, deep in the Sierras, he recorded and he had interactions with four or five of his hunting buddies. Now, it's like you got to take horses and pack in two or three days to go to this hunting camp in the middle of nowhere, which his camp was surrounded by these creatures, these hairy bipedal creatures. Not only were they hooping and hollering and making a lot of strange noises, but they were actually talking to each other. And you could hear this oh, but, 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 garbled language. Some people call it samurai chatter because it's very oh, da, da, da. it's this very weird. It almost sounds like a foreign language. So when he had all this recorded and he brought it to linguistical experts, language experts, military grade stuff, people that work for the Pentagon trying to break codes and translate things. And they broke down and they said, well, there's a number of phenomenon that's going on here in the Sierra Sounds. One, they can tell the same creature is reaching octaves higher and lower than humans can do. Almost to the set of having a second set of vocal cords. And a lot of people with the classic Sasquatch calls that you hear, it starts off really low and then goes into a high-pitched stream, way beyond any human or, or animal can do. But the other thing they encountered with the Sierra Sounds is not only were there frequency and optical phenomenon that couldn't be human or any known animal, but they also found markers of language, the same phrases and words, if you will, being repeated over and over again, having two or three or more creatures talking back and forth, uh, saying a, what would it, their equation of a sentence or phrases being responded by more sentences and phrases different than this one different than that and it had all the markers of language now we don't know what they're saying but it had all the markers of language as human language as we know it also if you look at the paul freeman video that's a pretty good one um just kind of use your judgment for me if it feels fake it's probably fake if it looks real don't say it's 100 percent real but observe what you know. Look at the motion. Does it look like a creature? How is the hair sticking to it? Does it look baggy like an oversized fur suit? Is there muscle tone? What can you see? 
How are the proportions? Are they non-human proportions? The documentary that we were talking about earlier about the guy who came out with these very clear images of Bigfoot on Netflix, the biggest problem that a lot of people had, and I got a lot of grief over this because I disagreed with him, is that his Sasquatch that he filmed had human proportions. The eyes and nose and mouth were all in range of humans. Where if you look at the Patterson-Gimlin film and some of the other images that they've caught of Sasquatches and the proportions of the upper lip, nose, everything way different than a human. It's somewhere, coincidentally, if you took a chimpanzee or a gorilla and you took a human, the proportions of what people have caught on film for Sasquatch is somewhere in the middle. So when you see something that's generally human sized and has human proportions, not completely dismissing that it's a fake or a hoax, but more than likely it's probably a guy in a suit or a reenactment. Yeah, there's that footage that's become real popular recently of up close of a face of a Bigfoot. There's two Bigfoots. It's been making the rounds. A lot of people have backed it. It's been a lot of documentaries and films. I personally think it's complete crap. I think it's a hoax. It doesn't correspond to any of, of what we know of what Bigfoot's supposed to look like, nor does it look specifically like what you would expect either an ape to look like or a modern hominin of that size. Some of the features are a little too thin. You know, like you, it, it just doesn't match anything that we know of in terms of description, historical description of what we know from the fossil record. All you see is the head, first of all, and that's, if you're able to capture the head that well, you should be able to wait, see the animal should be able to walk away or get up or do something else, you know? So that's the first sign. Another sign I look for, also in a lot of hoaxes, is when the camera's already focused on a particular spot, in it, like a trail, and all of a sudden something walks right through it, and then, you know, in perfect focus, and it disappears. That's usually a sign that you're dealing with, you know, fake footage. Here's where we get into some complicated areas. The gentleman at took those pictures or fabricated those pictures, has other footage that's actually pretty intriguing from earlier in Canada. I found that footage actually pretty decent. He's got some of like Bigfoot's walking up a hill and so forth. And that's the problem that we get into. You know, a lot of guys will go out there and they'll start off being honest researchers and they'll get a little bit of footage and I'll get a little bit, you know, a couple checks here and there and all of a sudden you need to prove more and more and more. And that's where a lot of the hoaxing comes about. The other thing you can do is if this, I've had people send me lots of pictures and say, this looks like a pretty convincing Sasquatch photo, what do you think? I go on Amazon and Google monkey suit or Bigfoot costume or gorilla costume, and I can see the exact same mask or look at the hands and I'm like, well, someone's hoaxing or someone was not hoaxing, but making a commercial or playing a prank or something. And then it got taken out of context too, you know? So I really don't think there's that many hoaxers. I just think, like I said, old college films, people doing something else, a bear at a wrong angle, and then people misinterpreting it. Um, but as far as deliberate hoaxers, I don't think there's necessarily that many. So I think you just kind of got to use their judgment. There's so much out there when it comes to photos of Bigfoot. Yeah, the question of why people would want to make hoaxes, I, I've never been able to wrap my head around it, you know, specifically. I think part of it, people just like to be on CV for two minutes. People just get off, you know, fooling people or... Maybe they think you can make some money off it. I mean, let me tell you, there's not a whole lot of money in the Bigfoot field, you know? I mean, you, you can make money off a hoax ultimately because you can't prove it. Well, there are a number of Bigfoot researchers who carry firearms in the woods. I'm one of them. And I have no intention of shooting a Sasquatch in cold blood. I have no intention of taking one for science or any of those other kind of stuff. It's purely defensive. If I'm attacked by a bear or a mountain lion, or believe it or not, humans can be very bad people. I think we all know that. So if I come across something in the woods that's perhaps dangerous and I shouldn't be there, whether it be human or otherwise, or a Sasquatch, there are a lot of people in the South. There's a lot of grow operations and things. And there's a lot of people in this world that just want to be left alone. Bigfoot, bear, human, or otherwise. And you don't want to mess with these people. So putting on a Bigfoot costume and running through some old man's backyard or through some fields is a bad idea. There's been a number of stories of people who have been shot at or shot or hit by cars who have been in Bigfoot costumes. You can find them. There was one in Montana a few years ago where a guy dressed up in a Sasquatch outfit and ran across the road and he got hit by a car and then got hit going the other way by another car by a teenager on her cell phone. It's not a smart thing. So there's one called a cripple foot, which I believe was in Washington. And the gentleman that I talked about is Dr. Meldrum from, I, I think, Idaho. And furthermore, there's also dermal ridges that have been found 
on some of his prints. So I found that pretty compelling because it's pretty hard to make dermal ranges if you're going to fake it. Also, you know, the flexibility in the foot, that's hard to reproduce, you know, if you do a hoax. And a lot of those are pretty flexible. And which is an interesting point because flexibility in the, in the, in the foot is actually a primitive adaptation. As you can see, like when the chimp props his foot around the tree, for example. And in fact, a small percentage of humans today have a flexible mate foot as a vestigial trait from uh, prior hominids. So when, that, you know, when you see something in the field like a footprint that makes sense in terms of what we know about anatomy, our evolutionary history or ape, you know, physiology, you take those a little more seriously. There's been plenty of hair samples that have been collected that get sent to labs. Now here's the thing, when you send, say you find a hair sample and you send it into a lab somewhere, you find a research, you find a college, you send it into a lab, they compare that hair to everything that's known. And they compare it to a region. There's no use for them comparing a hair sample that you found in Big Bear, California to a Bengal tiger, because as far as we know, there are no Bengal tigers in Big Bear. There could be a drug dealer with one, but anyway. So they're not gonna look for a Bengal tiger. What is in Big Bear? Well, bears, mountain lions, deer, raccoons, squirrels, other forest creatures. And when they analyze that hair, and they realize it comes up with none of that. Then they also look at, is it synthetic? Is it polypropylene? Is it a cheap wig costume type hair? Is it a human hair? And then from there, if you pay enough money and you wait enough time and you send it to enough labs, you can determine, is it a Bengal tiger hair? Is it a grizzly bear hair? And there's not supposed to be any grizzly bears here where there's some in the region of the United States, but not necessarily hair in Big Bear. Interestingly enough, there was grizzly bears once upon a time in Big Bear. That's how Big Bear got its name because they had really big bears. You can look at hair samples and you can look at DNA samples where they find hair samples or they find blood. They find things and they find this hair sample or they find DNA and the, the DNA samples that come up, they say, well, they're half human and half something else. So we don't know what it is, so it's not Bigfoot. Well, if they had a Bigfoot sample, they would know it was Bigfoot, but they don't have a sample. Once again, it's a comparative thing. You can't definitively say something, something, something if you've never seen it before. If you look at, like I said, photo evidence and video evidence and audio evidence, um, those are if you want good physical stuff. You have to look deep. You got to go through. Um, they have to cut the chaff from the wheat is kind of the expression. You got to cut through a lot of BS to get to it. But there's some good stuff on the Internet. There's some really good researchers. Yeah, I'm not sure what really keeps me in the field aside from just that spirit of exploration. I, I just love being out there, which is, you know, to me, whether you're out looking for Bigfoot or any other cryptozoological animal or aliens or you're out there trying to find, you know, proof of ghost, it's like Las Vegas, right? You know you can hit it big at any moment. And that, that addictive personality, I think it really feeds you because you're like, I can come around the corner and boom, and you'll lose more than you'll win. But I think just that little chance that, you know, you can come up with something. And also, I think it's important, you know, I think... If you look at the environment today, obviously we, there's a lot of ecological problems, right? There's fires in, from Siberia to, to the Congo, to the Amazon, to now in Australia. It's, we're talking about a lot of species are going extinct. And I think we forget sometimes that if we're dealing with even Bigfoot or any other, you know, Nessie, whatever you want to talk about, we're talking about real bona fide species that it's our responsibility to stop from going extinct. We need to start the state of the world, we need to really start thinking in terms of like saving the environment and saving some of these species that are, you know, you see species going extinct every day. And that, that literally keeps me up at night, the idea that we can have this species that can tell us so much about how to survive. Well, that's a whole other subject right there. The only time I ever find dead animals in the woods are generally from humans. Most animals don't want to be pecked to death or bitten to death or torn apart when they're dying. So they go seclude themselves somewhere and die in peace, away from other animals, away from humans. If I clunked you over the head in the woods and you were wandering around, you'd want to go find a shady safe spot away from what clunked you on the head and recover. And in, and in the woods, there's no medicine. You're gonna get better or you're gonna die. And you have to remember, North America has very acidic soil. So any bones that are left behind in the primary minerals and bones, calcium, magnesium, that other stuff, gets eaten away very quickly, especially in pine forest. Because pine needles are very acidic and all that breaks down in the woods. So 
things rot away very, very quickly as far as bones. And if you ever have encountered a dead body of an animal or um, shot squirrels or whatever, and you've maybe, you know, gutted them out or a gut pile or something, or you've come across an animal kill, even just go on National Geographic or YouTube and go or watch a Yellowstone National Park documentary where a winter kill happens, where an animal drops dead in the winter from the cold or a bear gets it or the wolves get it. Within three days, it's a, it's a half-picked skeleton. Within a week, it's a skeleton. Within two weeks, those bones are scattered. Within a month, you might find um, a rib bone. Most of the bones are broken and crunched by other animals. You might find a skull over here. You come back a year from that point, as more pine needles come down and rain and snow and everything else, they're gonna be half buried. You come back in two years, you'd be lucky if you'd find one bone of that creature. And I've experienced that growing up in the woods when I would visit my uncle's house in Montana. There was a moose that died by the river um, where, where he was and the river was uh, about a quarter mile from his house. And I remember when we first saw it, it was, it was like a skeleton. And my uncle told me that it died a month ago. And it was like, had flesh on everything. It was picked clean. It looked like a white skeleton from a museum. And then I remember over a few weeks coming back, the bones being a little more scattered, a little more broken down. And then I remember the next summer coming up to visit him, going back and looking for it and maybe finding one or two bones. And it was just as a kid, like, wow, things don't last long. So the animals are going to go away from humans and everything else and die where we don't. It's not going to be convenient for us to get to them. And when it comes to Bigfoot, if you look at Neanderthal species, if you look at a lot of other pre-humans, they have found burial sites of pre-humans. Large animals such as, such as elephants have been found coming back years later to where other elephants have died and mourning over them and picking up the skulls and playing with them and stuff in Africa. And they're showing signs of being mourned that they remember that person coming back to the death of an individual years later. Apes have, have exhibited this stuff too where they mourn for the loss of somebody, or there's an older ape or something that can't eat as well, so they're bringing them food. And in my opinion, Bigfoot's being much more closer to humans. Perhaps they bury their dead. The other thing to consider, times are tough. It's 15, 20 degrees out. It's really hard to hunt. We're buried up to our belly button in snow. If one falls dead, maybe they eat them. That's a six, seven hundred pounds of protein right there. There's lots of evidence that Modern humans ate Neanderthals and Neanderthals ate modern humans to this day. I and mean, there's, there's, you know, like cannibalism happens. It's very taboo. And it's very common in other species. Bears will eat other bears. There's that, it, it, it's common in every species out there, cannibalism. And there's even new stuff come out in the last couple of years with chimpanzees, where a troop of chimpanzees will go invade another troop of chimpanzees and eat them. They'll tear them apart very violently. It's horrific to watch people killing or there'll be a troop of chimpanzees and there'll be the leader and the young leader will go kill and eat and dismember the very violent stuff the older chimpanzees to take over the troop so why would we think that bigfoot who has a striking resemblance to humans and apes would not possibly bury their dead would not possibly eat their dead would not possibly dispose of their bones and crunch them up who knows if you have a patch of woods, there's been a Bigfoot sighting there. And I think anybody who's grown up in either the country or semi-rural area, there's always the stories of don't go down that road or, oh, those old woods are haunted or grandpa told you, you can hunt on the east side of the mountain, but don't hunt on the west side of the mountain. Why? Just because I said so, don't hunt on the west side of the mountain. And you start looking at these historical encounters, the boogeyman reports or the beast of this or the monster of that. And you start looking at maps Devil's Canyon, Eight Canyons, Devil's Slide, Devil's Playpen, Demon Ridge. Wow, why do they have such dark, grim names? Death Valley, Death This, Death That. And you're like, well, how come it wasn't Sunshine Ridge? Or, you know, Flower Meadow, you know? No, no, it was called Death Canyon for a reason. You start looking at it and you start looking at these things and it's like virtually anywhere there is a, a substantial patch of woods. My rule is if you see deer and you see water, it could possibly, possibly support a Bigfoot. Yeah, I think there's a plethora of species that have been, you know, discovered throughout the years from new monkey species to obviously there's tons of ocean species get discovered every year. Some big mammals were discovered in Vietnam in the 90s. And, you know, I think that that gives me a lot of hope. I, 
you know, in the Amazon, well, I figure there's a species discovered every, every week, technically, a new species. Now, a lot of them are small, granted, you know. There's no difference to me between discovering a new biological species of any kind and Bigfoot because we're still dealing with, you know, kind of the same modality. I mean, we've explored what's percentage of the world, not as high as people think. A lot of this, these areas have been mapped from the air, but no one's been on the ground. There's a lot of open areas up there, especially if people don't realize it's not like we don't know more about the wilderness today. Most people moving into cities, you know, are moving away from living out in the woods or in the jungle. It's very interesting. Up until very recently, we thought chimpanzees were mostly fruit eaters, and they found that they actually eat way more meat than we thought. So now, the vast majority of the diet still is fruit, but they also live in a very tropical climate where there is a lot of fruit and there is a lot of vegetable and plant matter. Um, but they find it eating a lot more meat than they, than, they, than they previously thought. There's not much in terms of having a DNA evidence. There's been some blood samples, but again, you can only correlate it to Bigfoot because it was allegedly left by Bigfoot, but you weren't there when it happened, right? But nonetheless, uh, some of the hair samples, and not just here, but we've had some in China, that turn out to be primate, closely related to human, but not human. And that's as far as you can go. Because the way DNA works is there's a database, right, of all the known species. And all you can do is not, if it doesn't match, you have something new. But you can't identify it because you can't match it to anything. And since there's no official Bigfoot species in, you know, officially biologically or in the DNA database, it comes back as unknown. But there's enough hair samples, and I think there's one blood sample, I believe, that was taken up way up north in, uh, uh, I think it was in Canada, that came up as, you know, primate, non-human. And that's extremely intriguing, you still have to explain that. What's going on is there's a bunch of stories of people who've shot these things over the years. And people have come out, the trucks have pulled up, the helicopters have landed, and they've disposed of the bodies. And people have said, if you know it's good for you, you saw a bear, or nothing happened here. It seems like the government's okay with you talking about them, with you even going out in the woods and looking for them, or even making videos about them. But if you get that good, clear video, it's either going to disappear or it's going to be discredited. Now, once somebody gets good, solid information, if you come to me and say you saw Bigfoot, that's fine. But if you and three or four of your buddies were out on a hike and you all saw it at the same time and now four or five people are telling the same story about the same location, maybe even one of you has a cell phone picture of it, that's when you might experience some kind of a cover up. Now, the reason for the cover up is why would they want it suppressed? And there's many levels of it. There's a very practical level of if they acknowledged Bigfoot existed, they would have to protect them and they would have to study them and then um, that goes into the logging industry would be shut down and there's a lot of insiders in the logging industry they, they, they know farewell about Bigfoots and they hate Bigfoots and some of them I've even heard stories hire guns to go out and chase them off because if there's Bigfoots in the area they slow down the loggers and they don't want any proof and then there's a lot of missing people there's tons of people who have gone missing in the woods and I myself think not all of them but some of those people have probably been taken and killed or eaten by Bigfoot and that's a big liability if the government knows it. And then you start getting into the more, you know, that Bigfoot isn't a natural creature. Maybe they have a more paranormal element. Maybe there's some kind of genetic manipulation. Maybe there's um, some that have been manipulated in the lab. Um, maybe some have an alien connection. Maybe some have a biblical connection. And that would kind of go against evolution and creation. And there's a lot of different levels from very practical reason to why they'd want to cover it up to some very out there conspiracy type stuff. But whatever reason it is, there is a campaign to keep it a Bigfoot, a beef jerky commercial, to keep it a joke, to keep Bigfoot on the fringe of things, to keep it as a coffee mug or a funny t-shirt, hide and seek champion. And oh yeah, he saw Bigfoot. Yeah, I bet you he got abducted by aliens to keep it a joke. That is starting to go away. I think the internet's a beautiful thing and as much suppression can be on the internet. I've seen a lot of other really good YouTube creators have their views go in the toilet, have subscribers be actively unsubscribed. It's really whatever it is. And there's, there's no saying it's the government. There's no saying it's a third party entity. There's no saying it's the Illuminati or third world or uh, new world order or whatever, whatever it is, not saying it's one thing or whatever it is, whatever entity out there. If you look close enough, there's actively, 
an organization or a group of people trying to suppress the truth about Bigfoot. I think if they, if whoever is covering up was going to disclose Bigfoot, I said this before, the easiest way they could do it, if you think they're going to have a press conference where they're going to have a slideshow and someone's going to, you know, the director of the National Park Service or whatever is going to come out and say, or the Department of Interior, whoever that is, the tie at big press conference, hey, we know Bigfoot exists and this is what we know. That's never going to happen. What they would probably do was stop enforcing it. Stop covering it up. Just stop. And let footage come out. Let somebody shoot one. Let somebody hit one with a truck and bring it in and then start from there. And that's kind of, I think, how disclosure, they always say in the UFO world, disclosure. We want disclosure. And I always think, do you know how the government works? They're not going to have that press conference and say, and bring a little green man out on the stage and say that we know all that. They're not going to do that. Like I said, the best thing they could do is stop classifying and stop covering it up and let new information come out. You know, a lot of people talk about disclosure. But they're waiting on this, like, almost like on this messiah to give you disclosure. And that's not going to happen, you know, obviously. I mean, every year it's like, yeah, this is going to be the year. You know, I think we should be focusing a lot more on being proactive and hitting those areas that a lot of people want to go into. You know, instead of reacting, you know, be proactive, which is, in a sense, the same way we do Bigfoot research, right? We try to be proactive, go and get the evidence and find, you know, Bigfoot ourselves. And I think... Whatever strange, you know, phenomena or modalities you're dealing with, I think that should be the approach. Matt Squatch is a play on Sasquatch. Um, back in the day, I had a big gnarly beard. Everybody said I looked like a Sasquatch, so they would call me Matt Squatch, and it was, it was just kind of a nickname. I actually started just as, as a generic YouTube channel. I wanted to do cooking videos and do some prepping videos and some hikes, and I told a couple Bigfoot stories on there. And they, they kind of you know, went viral, but a lot of people watched them and was very interested. And then Wes had me on Sasquatch Counters, and then I said, a number of people. And then I just started talking about Bigfoot videos and kind of just did it for fun. And then my own research, even before all this and stuff, I was looking at the, I had notes, I still have the notes in my phone of, hey, the Pacific Northwest, these, these type of Bigfoots look a lot like this. In the South, they look a lot like this. And here they look a lot like this. And then it was the four types of Bigfoot. Then it was the 10 types of Bigfoot. And then that went popular. And then I started showing my research and things and ideas. And it just kind of took off from there. Everything from hardcore science videos to some more lighthearted stuff to more paranormal based and conspiracy type stuff. Whatever you want to know about Bigfoot, I've probably talked about it. And I'm on a hiatus right now, but I am going to pick it up soon and continue to talk about more. There's field research videos where I'm out in the woods looking at stuff. Lots of videos discussing different subgenres and questions like how much does a Bigfoot weigh? How much, how tall do they get? You know, different type of things. Uh, you know, what do tree structures mean? What do tree knocks mean? What do the different calls mean? My interpretations of what these things mean. Not that I definitively know, but my opinions based on what I've heard and what other researchers have done. I look up famous Bigfoot sightings on, on different websites and go to that location and kind of do a follow-up even years later. Look at the surroundings. Could this area support a Bigfoot? Could it not support a Bigfoot? Is there cover? And break it down from different cases and famous sightings and stuff and uh, go through lore. Kind of cover all sorts of things Bigfoot. There are a lot of very good people, a lot of normal people that on the weekends, instead of, you know, going to play basketball or whatever they do, they go out in the woods and they look for Bigfoot. A lot of them have very good evidence. Like any field, there's good and bad. You know, people get very protective of their information. People get very protective of their evidence. But there's a lot of good people, um, a lot of normal people who have experienced something extraordinary and they just want answers. And they're not in it for... The gratification they're not in it for the notoriety they're not in it to prove they're not in it to shoot one and bring one in and be i, I shot bigfoot look at me they just want answers and that's kind of what the core where i was at with it too is they really want answers and there's a lot of really good people people have to stop thinking that we should be doing this for free in the field because and not because you know i want to drive a nice car or i want to go out and you know and with the ladies or whatever you know but it's expensive man it, it takes a lot you know and i I spend most of my time here frustrated in my apartment because I can't get out there. So I think we need to really start thinking in terms of having a professional team that is well funded by people that are capable. I think that's the only way we're going to find anything, you know. So for me personally, that's what I'm focused on right now. What astounded me a couple years back when I went to a Bigfoot conference, the International Bigfoot Conference, 
listening to the guest speakers, approaching the experts, talking to the people who had their books and getting all the different things. It's just the people in the audience. I remember sitting next to this one older, older gentleman, shirt tucked in, big mustache. He looked like an old cowboy, and he owned a ranch in Washington State. He was like, yeah, I was kind of hoping to talk to Professor uh, uh, Meldrum about these footprints. And he had a binder in his lap. And I'm like, what kind of footprints? Well, I've seen them a few times off my porch and you can always dismiss somebody in a sighting. He opens his book and he's got perfect Sasquatch footprints left in the snow, hundreds of yards of tracks, strides way bigger than any of us could do, big giant footprints all in the snow. Then he's got pictures of them in the springtime in the mud. He's got pictures of fur. He's got tree breaks and snaps and things, weird structures like 10 feet up in the air. He's had stuff swiped off his porch, all that kind of stuff. And he's got this big binder full of all these pictures and evidence. And I'm like, these are gold. What are you going to, you want to share these? And he's like, oh, no, not interested. These are just for me. And I just wanted to talk to Meldrum privately about it. And he shared them with me. How many people have stuff like that, that they just, they don't want the attention. They don't want people on their property. They don't want finding Bigfoot on their front door. They don't want, they don't want it. They just want their own private answers that have this kind of evidence. So there's great evidence out there. You just need to look. When people say they're, I love it when you get, it's always somebody who's typically college educated too, who considers themselves fancy. Like uh, people in my family um, have PhDs or they're medical doctors, or my aunt is a wildlife researcher and she studies bears and wolverines and stuff like that. And they track them and collar them. And having a conversation with her about Bigfoot, she's like, well, there's no evidence for Bigfoot. And I go, BS. What do you want? Do you want to see video? Do you want to hear audio? Do you want footprints? Do you want hair samples? Do you want DNA? Do you want thousands of years of Native American traditions from virtually every tribe all across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, all referring to the same creature? Do you want thousands of modern day reports from every walk of life? You want physical evidence? The evidence is there. It's just up to you to believe. And you reach a certain point where you say there is no evidence and you look at all the evidence that I described. And then you listen to all the eyewitness reports. And then you look at the really credible eyewitness reports from firefighters, military cops, people of who are supposed to be trusted. Then you look at historical encounters. And how much evidence do I have to present to you before I'm not the ridiculous one and you are? If I've shown you everything you've asked for and you're still not convinced, then the only thing that's going to convince you is Bigfoot in person. And I cannot provide that to you. I can't go to a museum and point at a stuffed one. I can't go to a zoo, which I think would be sad, and point at one in a cage. And good luck trying to keep him in there. So. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe one thing that doesn't get talked about enough is the danger associated with going out in the woods and looking for Bigfoot, you know? So we have a lot of TV shows, right, that dram dramatize or show how much fun it is to go out in the woods, but you're still putting yourself in in certain danger you're out in the woods and it's not for everyone and I get that but whether you're dealing with a hominid species so related to man or an ape species you're still dealing with a certain amount of danger you're dealing with a big species big animal that may feel threatened when you go towards this territory so I don't want people to go out there and go oh, bring their kids we're gonna go looking for Bigfoot and you know in an alleged you know Bigfoot area I think there's a certain amount of danger to that you're still dealing with either you know again a wild animal or a primitive human that may feel threatened and they'll react to defend themselves or especially if they have a you know a juvenile nearby i think we need to start thinking in terms of that i mean there's tons of disappearances right out in the forest people disappear all the time they're never found i've personally i've heard some stories of people being attacked people that didn't want to go on the record but they've told me they've been attacked by bigfoots you know a group of them at times even I even tell you an exclusive story, and this isn't from North America, but it's from, uh, it happened in, in uh, Nepal. And this was years ago, but I can again exemplify kind of the dangers involved. So this was this, uh, this doctor, he actually worked for the CIA, doing whatever work he was doing, right? And he was over this ledge, and he was hearing this growling. And the other side of the ledge was a tiger, and what he called a, a yeti. And in, in, in the middle of that, there was like some kind of dead prey, like a deer or whatever, you know, native species similar to deer in Nepal. And apparently a tiger and a yeti were, were fighting for, you know, for who's going to get to eat, you know, tonight. And at some point, you know, apparently the tiger swiped at the yeti and the yeti apparently got pissed off 
and grabbed the tiger, put it over his head, snapped his back, threw it on the ground, and then grabbed the prey and walked off. Now, I got this second, you know, kind of second generation story, so I can't prove it. But this was private. There's no, I don't see, you know, reason why someone would lie. And I've heard similar stories like that. So you're still dealing with something that's very big, very strong. And there's a certain amount of danger, you know, associated with going out there. The thing I always tell and I end all my videos, I always say, stay safe in the woods. There's virtually nothing in this world that is harmless. What makes you think that a seven, eight, nine, ten foot tall creature is harmless? Now, they aren't godless, bloodthirsty killing machines. You have to think of them as like a bear or like a gorilla or like a mountain lion. Or if there was an uncontacted tribe of people, like there's still parts of the globe where they're untrack, uncontacted tribes. You know how they meet un outsiders with arrows and spears. It's a passion. But it's a passion where I think you also need time away because I, I do know sometimes nightmare stories of people who it becomes an obsession to the point where it actually affects their lives and marriages and things because that obsession quite literally takes over and, um, and I can see how easily that can happen but for me, you know, I have to have time to see what's going on with the soccer. If you're out in Bigfoot area, and besides, if you take bear spray with you, which is really hopped up pepper spray, if you take a buddy with you, if you take a GPS locator, if you take a map with you and extra water and a first aid kit, if you take a big hunting knife, if you take a machete, you take that bear spray, pepper spray, if you can, take a gun. If you don't like guns, I get it. You know, take bear spray with you. What have you lost? Nothing. You're prepared against bears and mountain lions and everything else out there. But... Preparing yourself, you have never lost anything. You've only ever gained for it. So stay safe in the woods. Be aware that there's more in the woods than trees and squirrels. Not everything is in your friend. When you're out in nature, you're in nature's element. You are not in charge. This isn't your house, you're out in nature.